Cave painters and cuneiformists invent a pictorial language. Make the Bible palatable for the illiterate, and wonder why that orange cat really does hate Mondays so much. <laughs> Because it's time to talk tall to me. Whew, that was a rough takeoff. I like, like it though. I like it. That was, was like flying Ryanair. <laughs> Ryanair oh. is that a thing? Yeah, not known for its takeoffs or its landings. Oh, fair enough. I mean. What else you got, Ryanair? Come on now. Cheap prices. Oh. Welcome back, everyone, to the podcast. I am Omen Said, and I am Nick McGill. Together, we are Feckless Moms, and this is Talk Tall to Me, a weekday funny paper in which Nick and I will jump from panel to panel, desperately trying to cling on to a shaky narrative. Which is the discography of prog rock band Jethro Tull. Sometimes we'll laugh, sometimes we'll cry, sometimes we'll just shake our heads and say, "This person was actually paid to do this." Yeah, yeah. Little orphan Ian will one day be adopted by a nice bald man. Ah, <laughs> uh, who's bald? Was Dave Pegg bald? Somebody was bald. Someone was like bald as a cue ball. Who the bassist like, was bald in the eighties or nineties? I thought it was. I thought it was. Oh no, um, no, no! You're you're right. The pianist. Piano, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So he got a, he got adopted. Happy ending for everybody. <laughs> Full disclosure: I forgot to write my triptych. <laughs> and so here we are. devolution. Yep, there we go. So Nick, exciting week, isn't it? It is. It, I would say it is. Yeah. We will eventually yeah. this week talk about the final bonus track off of "Too Old to Rock and Roll, Too Young to Die." Technically, it is, but I've got one more I'm throwing on the end, and in, in including in the "Too Old" universe, and you'll find out why very soon. How very dare you? Very soon, you'll find out in about an hour. Yeah. Excellent. But before we dive into the what has now suddenly, as I've been informed, become the penultimate track off of the album, <laughs> uh, as far as bonus tracks goes, do we have any housekeeping, Nick? We sure do. That's right. It's time to play. What are you drinking, Omen? What are you drinking today, Nick? I am drinking a lovely little glass. Of Campari this evening. Mm. Ah, yes, the Italian digestif, which was initially gaining its red color from the crushed carapaces of a certain type of beetle, but oh, which I've now been assured is no longer the case. The quality just went downhill when there weren't crunchy bits of beetle in it. <laughs> now with fewer beetles. <laughs> Usually I have it with soda, but I'm out of soda. So it's just straight Campari. It's bisexual Campari, yes, mm, with mm -hmm. ice on it. Icy, icy cold. Yeah, icy indeed. Nick, what are you drinking? I am drinking some fresh squeezed grapefruit juice mm. with some Ithaca Brewing ginger beer, mm. non-alcoholic ginger beer, with a little bit of Hendrix Gin's Lunar Limited Release. Oh, it is infused with natural oils of the night, whatever that means. I Take that as you will. You'll find out when you're older, Nick. Don't worry. I can't wait. I'm so excited to be a man. I got hair finally. <laughs> the post office delivered. But it, it is it is lovely. It's it's floral and delicious, and it works well with the citrus and the spike of the ginger. I like it a lot. That sounds really delicious, and like it has a, a lovely lovely dose of vitamin C. It does. I need it. The scurve has kicked in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a tough winter. <laughs> well, excellent. Now, Nick, do we have any any correspondence before jumping into our episode? In fact, that we do as well. Marley and Marley. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Marley. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Marley. I've given up speaking for Lent. Oh, yeah. Mm. How's that? How's that going? Yeah. I feel great. <laughs> Just cleansing your soul, I imagine. Yeah. I've never felt more myself. But that's wonderful, Mary. You should really look into a silent retreat. I think you'd you'd go over well there. I thought that's what I was. Oh no! I mean, Omen and I are talking. Oh, 
Ah! I thought it was just me thoughts. <laughs> I mean, m- maybe. I-, I did not know that you had telepathy, but... It's hard to, hard to know really what's going on. That's true. That's valid, yeah. Well, Omen, I believe you have two emails, correct? Yes. I sure do. <clears throat> Your emails, sir. Why don't we start with Paul M. Previous writer in her. Thank you, Paul. Subject, me again, smiley face emoticon. <laughs> Message, good evening, Nick. Good evening, Omen. I hope this email finds you and yours keeping safe and well. Smiley face emoticon. Big fan of that emoticon, by the way. I use it a lot. May I offer my continued thanks to you in admiration of your podcast, you may, and particularly your thoughts on Salamander, both the animal with supposedly mythic properties and the Tull Song. Yes, you may. I had never considered the allegorical possibilities of the lyric, and that really liberated new meanings for me. Thank you! You touched on how Ian and Martin both seem particularly enamored with the song, and the dueling guitars setup that recording it created between them. I'm guessing the song left a considerable impression on Mr. Anderson, as his music publishing from about a year after this album is handled by a company called Salamander and Son. Certainly all Tull albums in the 70s and 80s from about 1978 carry that name. And I'm wondering if this name was a product of Ian's recent fatherhood in 77 and the obvious wordplay of Salamander and Son. Remember, this is the chap who credits an Ina Sandrone in the booklet for a passion play. He loves an anagram. Coincidence? I think not. All that said, I think I concur with your assessment that Salamander, the song, is a pretty and complex guitar ditty. It doesn't necessarily fit the brief of the album slash musical, but it was too good a song to be dropped altogether and became the name of the love interest just to give the piece a home on the record. As ever, brilliant work from the Momes. I have but a handful of tall loving friends, but I name check your podcast to them often. Keep the show rolling. Five stars, five stars, five stars, five stars, five stars. To you. And then there are five asterisks. Paul M. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Both for all your kind words and for the, the little tidbit about the company named Salamander and Son. Nick, I was not aware of that. I didn't, I, I had no idea. I genuinely thought that it was all chrysalis. I didn't know at all. And I did a little research upon receiving that email. And I mean, I got a little bit, but really the bulk of the information that I got was it is a music company sometimes or, or mostly connected with Ian Anderson right. of Jethro Tull. That's it. Well, it could be that, it's that Salamander and Son is the one handling the uh, the copyright of the lyrics and such. Yeah, yeah. The kind of the behind the scenes stuff that we just wouldn't know about. Right. Often, I, I do, I have heard that often music, uh, you know, bands will have several companies that are essentially all under one umbrella, but, you know, do slightly different things that are maybe separate for tax purposes. Sure. Right. And I love the, right. I, I wouldn't have guessed, I wouldn't have thought of the anagram situation. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. And I, I, I definitely think you're right on that, Paul. It is when we do find them, we definitely do see Ian playing with words. I think it's it's pretty appropriate to to think that. That's right. All right. Thank you, Paul. Moving on to the next email, we have a another prescription from the good doctor, Doc Savage. To see the kindly doctor. Subject: the old front stalls. Just in case, Nick, no one else answers your request, bingo halls were frequently to be found in old repurposed cinemas. Hence, those who came to play the game would be sitting in the old front stalls, the stall seats, in other words, where previous generations had watched movies. Bingo, one of those things which has slowly, inelicably risen and fallen out of fashion in my lifetime was, and to a small extent is, an early evening pastime often connected with women of a certain age. Absolutely loving your work, you almost made me like Salamander. (laughs) And you did make me go to YouTube and find the video piece you mentioned, which is hilarious beyond words. 
May your good humor continue long, Doc Savage. Thank you, Doctor. Nick, I that was a new word for me in there. I do want to say that our Anglo correspondent did also chime in with clarifying the old front stalls. The the old front stalls. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, the word is in in el in el table. Ineluctable. Ineluctably. Ineluctable. Unable to be resisted or avoided. Inescapable. Yeah, nice. Oh, well, we Good all word. learned something new on the podcast. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, so that is it for emails. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Doc Savage. Thank you, Omen, for reading them. Thank you, Nick, for talking about them. <laughs> I, I reckon it's time to dive into the penultimate track, as you said, Strip Cartoon. Ooh. Shall we uh, Shall we strip into this bad boy? Let's cartoon to listen. <laughs> let's, let's listen to this cartoon. Oh, that's so much better. All right, play it. There it is. <laughs> Fish and chips and paper liquids and a rainy pavement. A Soho lights, another night, thinking of you. Nick. Omen, strip cartoon. There it is. <laughs> Yeah, just over three minutes, three and a quarter. Not bad. A nice, nice, fun, bouncing little ditty. Yeah, almost like a radio length. Yeah, pretty perfect. I could definitely see this as as even just being considered for a single. Yeah. Well, and fun fact, Nick. Give it to me. The reason it is a bonus track is because it was released as the B-side of the single. Can you guess what it was? Probably the only single off this album was Too Old, right? It was not off this album. It was off the next album. And the reason I'm stalling is because I had it in my head a minute ago, and now I can't remember. Whistler! That's it. Off of... What a bizarre pair of singles to put out. I actually think they work great together. They, they, They contrast... Delightfully, you know, very much. We'll so, talk yeah. about we'll talk about Whistler later, but mm-hmm. it's it's obviously got a very very particular sa- sound, and so does this. Uh-huh. I think they contrast well, but so this didn't come out until a couple years after the interesting the two old album, but must have been recorded or at least conceived around the same time. Yeah, right, right. Must be inspired is what I was going to say, but yeah, yeah. Let's let's do music first. So the intro is so fun. It's so dramatic. Honestly, it it almost yeah. feels more appropriate for a musical than I know. a lot of the stuff off of the album proper. Yeah, when you said that this came out, well, was released later, it it, it very much surprised me because it feels perfectly like it fits with the the show. I know. I know. Crazy. And you know, maybe it maybe it was for the show and maybe it just didn't mm-hmm. didn't have space on the album. Who True. knows? Yeah. Yeah. Musically it, it's a great sound. A lot going on, but it's such a good sound all around. In opposition to what we hear mostly off this album, where we have a lot of, you know, one instrument comes in and then another another comes in and mm-hmm. then another and it builds layer by layer. This is everything at once. Flute, yes. guitar. Drums, bass, everything just organ, I think. They all just drop with that first beat. Dum dee dee dee. I can hear it all. There's nothing like falling away in the background. You can pick every single piece out from the instrumentation. Yeah. And it's, it's their, their, I mean, they are at their prime right now. And it's so good. It's so, so good music. And especially we with the advantage of living here in the future. Oops, I've said too much already. We have... Abort! We, I have to turn off my robot. <laughs> we have this advantage of the Steve Wilson remix, et cetera, yes. and all the yep. all the other remixes, you know, and so it's, I'm sure it, I'm sure the sound quality is cleaner. I don't want to say better, but yes. cleaner now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you say, did you say organ? I did say organ. Would he be using like a, a synth keyboard at this point? There's got to be one, right? Well, in seven seventy six, seventy five, seventy six. I don't know. I think we should refer maybe to the video and try to remember mm. what he was playing in that video. Mm-hmm. I do know that the Hammond organ was popular at the time. Okay, and that did have lots of different settings on it, but it wasn't digital. Gotcha. But it was an electric organ. Oh yes. Gotcha. Okay, so like a precursor, because that that those first notes that John's hitting, 
that's got to be like a harpsichord setting or something in there. Yes, I think it is. Then it later turns into like a flute at the very end. It's got like a flute sound. I think that's just the layering of Ian's flute on, on top of it. <laughs> I think that's there, but there, it's also th the keyboard has a silly setting. A silly to it setting. Oh, they probably put sure it on yet. the silly setting. On the silly setting. I, I, John was told not to, but I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I anything. had the technicians remove the silly setting, but <laughs> to no avail. He found a way to bypass it. <laughs> he hotwired that organ like a, <laughs> like it was escaping with the Grand Prix winner. Yeah, but a, a lovely mix of sound overall. Very much so. Very much so. Tambourine. Yes. So come to my place, when Martin comes in at the bridge with his electric, that pew, pew, yeah. and then he just rips. Oh, it's so good. It's what one it's of my. Really, really I think good. one of the standout individual riffs on this album. I, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't recall him being so kind of free and funky with the other stuff. I know that the term to shred mm -hmm. as a verb referring to playing the guitar in an exciting fashion didn't come into popularity until later, I believe at least. But I <laughs> In an exciting fashion. That is the most banal definition I've ever heard. Thank you. I took out all the spice. But I do think that I do think that we can <laughs> we can comfortably say that Martin is shredding the guitar on this song. A precursor to the shred. A, certainly. A proto shred. <laughs> is there a key change at the very end? Oh, Nick. Is that drastic enough for a key change? Or is it just, just a couple of notes that it's not? It doesn't reach that point of the commitment of the key change. No, no. It's a, it's a full key change. Okay. It is... Perhaps my least favorite part about this song, and, and I, I may, <laughs> perhaps I'm offending our listeners by saying that, but it's my opinion. I think it's really funny because at, at that point in the song, I'm like, oh my gosh, this has been a great song. And it's winding down what a lovely aftertaste I'm going to have. Key change! Yeah, it goes up. It almost feels like, it doesn't feel like a whole step. It feels like a half to a three quarter step of a key change. And then it doesn't, the last note it hits does not resolve. It leaves us on a sustain that doesn't quite feel right, right. as well. I think that traditionally most key changes are a half step. Oh, okay. Okay. A three quarter step would probably only be employed in um, in Eastern music. but In prog rock. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you. And it's funny because, uh, again... Key changes are something, and particularly key changes of that style, are something that we see often used in musical theater. True, yeah. So it's really funny to me that this song has so many of the the techniques that I associate at least with musical theater, and yet it's not on the album. Right. Has has to be a part of it. Has to have been written at the same time. I reckon. I'm, I'm sticking with it, yeah. Let's stick with it. At least musically, I think it's making sense. I think when we get into the lyrics, we may sure. we may undermine our sandcastle a little bit. Yeah, our sandpaper lips. <laughs> Speaking of lyrics and sandpaper lips, what what great poetry in this in the lyrics? I love his word usage here. This is one of my favorite songs off of the album to sing. Like if I'm driving around and this song comes mm. on, I will sing it the whole thing. Yeah, or what I think the lyrics are. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I don't know the lyrics well enough to be able to sing it, but I, I can I could get the choruses. I'm good with that. Let's also talk a little bit about the the doo-doo doo section. Doo 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 It's very poppy. Yeah, it is very it's, poppy. It's yeah. got a pop sound, yeah. <laughs> And there's something that we hear there, which is a little unusual in the Tulliverse, which is the flute and Ian's voice doubled. Mm. Almost in unison. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, obviously that wouldn't work in a live setting if you were, if you only had Ian Anderson. But, you know, you, I'm sure, unless Martin was playing the flute, as he sometimes has been known to do. Mm -hmm. 
I just think it's it's interesting and it's and it's lovely. It sounds it's super fun. It is a little like ear candy. It is. It very much is. And I, I think I think the I think the key change well you said musical theater. I was thinking pop music with the key change. Yeah, sure. But yeah, it feels it feels like it it's still got a tall sound and a, a tall like skeleton, a tall structure, but the the exterior is has a different coat of paint on it where where it does have this slightly pop sound to it. It's a tall skeleton in some in a pop cadaver. <laughs> yes. Some sick bastard did some science. I know what I'm going <laughs> science in for Halloween tricks. next year. <laughs> Horrifying. But I love it. I love this song. It's one of these songs that musically I can just like listen to and it's super fun and mm-hmm. I enjoy it. Yeah. Lyrically, I I texted you earlier today being like, Nick, what is this song about? I have zero idea. Yeah, I I don't quite know like there at certain points i think i know what it is and then another stanza comes in and i'm like but maybe not i don't and you know i think that part of the difficulty in understanding it comes from the structure lyrically this is one of those odd andersonian structures where the verses are front loaded and the choruses Mm. are back loaded it's Mm -hmm. it has two big sort of double verses yeah and then three choruses in a row. Yeah. And then a chorus reprise, with, and that's it. And you're like, well, okay. Yeah, with, and sometimes when he does the choruses like that, he'll swap out words, he'll change tenses, or or play with homonyms or something. Not the, not here. It, the three choruses are identical. The only difference between them is one of them has a key change, and so he repeats the words strip cartoon. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the thing that's so peculiar about that to me is that with the choruses, we have the addition of the phrase, because I'm a leading politician at a dangerous age. Because I'm a leading politician at a dangerous age. What? Okay. Which to me kind of throws off or complicates everything that's come before it. Exactly, yeah. So let's get into some of the specifics. There are some things which at least are recognizable as as images Mm-hmm. Fish and chips, sandpaper. Blah, blah, blah. The, the first one that we have that is that really keys us into something is Soho Lights, Another Night Thinking of You. Soho Lights, Another Night Thinking of You. Soho, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that he does not refer to Soho, the neighborhood in New York City, which refers to south of Houston Street, but rather Soho in London which is a a very old neighborhood which initially was a public grazing land, but then King Henry VIII in 1536 made it into a royal park. And the reason it, it has the name Soho is because they would go hunting in that park, and Soho hmm. is what you say when you see a hare. Cool. Yes. Hmm. Later on, it became the the chosen spot for the aristocracy, but then cholera happened, and after that, in the 20th century, it was where a lot of the sex work industry and nightlife was. So Soho still worked then. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. It's I'm what sorry. you say. It's what you yell when you see a bar open. Yes, that. So is this Ray singing to Salamander? Is this... Ian singing to Shona. Let's not talk about the politician yet. We won't get to the politician yet. Of those two options, I'm more willing to bet heavily on the second one. Yes, that was my initial thought. Yeah. Because it seems more like it's the way it's described and the way that, and the tone of it is much more describing Ian's London than mm-hmm. Ray Lomas's London. Okay. Okay. Another fun image we have Black Cat sat on a wall, winks at me darkly. Black Cat. You're familiar with those old-fashioned clocks where it's a cat and who and, and the tail is a pendulum. It sort of is yeah. modeled after Felix the Cat, the cartoon. Mm-hmm. Okay, which would have been around at that point. He was he was one of the original 
well, not the original, but he was a very early strip cartoon, I believe. I'm interested to look that up, actually. I got it. It's a race. 1919, first appearance. Until? Oh, until... I mean, he, he, he made his way onto... I remember watching his cartoon as a kid, so it's... I mean, he's been around for a while. All right, so past the... Past the 70s. Yes. Yes, I would say so, yeah. Right. So a little interesting sly reference to a cartoon early on from that from that clock. Mm-hmm. And the cat suggests ways and means that I might win you a smile. Which is very different from Ray's perspective, which is all, you know... Oh, yeah. Go, blimey, what a luscious pair of titties. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's yeah. almost word for word from the and, album inset. Yeah, you can't be angry. As from your heart, you bear your parts to the gentleman. As from your heart, you bear your parts to the gentleman. All right, so, Nick... Is is this a ballerina reference? I think there are various possibilities here. As as we know, Shona was a ballerina, not when Ian met her, mind you, but... So maybe this is a romantization... Romantization? No, romantization. Put another is in there. Is romanticization. Maybe this is a romantifying of if Ian had met her organically, like on the street, as opposed to bumping into her in Chrysalis. Right. It could be that. Well, I mean, or it could be describing a situation where, you know, someone is working as a dancer in a club. Mm-hmm. You know, because we have the whole play of of the word strip. A strip cartoon. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. To bear, yep. to bear one's parts to the gentleman is to strip. But by the same token, that could also be referring to working in a pub, although pubs closed before 1230. Although maybe in Soho they stayed open longer. But, you know, let's say it's a let's say it's a, a, a supper club or something or a, or a saloon or a, a nightclub of some kind. You know, the drinks, the drinks servers We'll often dress in a in a way in in a provocative manner so that they procure more tips. Sure, right. Which fits in with the gentlemen who try to keep their who uh, in that that fun little rhythm thing. Well, they drool trying to keep their cool. Spill the scotch and water. While they drool trying to keep cool. But I'm not that way, I must say. I'd, I'd much prefer to see you in your texturized rubber rainwear around 12.30. But I'm not that way, I must say. I'd much prefer to see you in your texturized rubber rainwear around 12.30. I don't want to go and ogle you and pay you tips. I just, I want you to come out so I can talk to you on the street. In the rain, yeah. In the rain, yeah. Like a person. Right. You don't have to be in skimpy wear. You can be in, in galoshes and uh, and uh, and Wellingtons and, and, and um, the, the... Paddington bear hat. Thank you. Yeah, the, the fisherman. There's a fish stick guy that, that has the the full yellow slicker. Oh, the fish stick guy. Yeah, the fish stick the guy fish slicker, stick I think, guy. is what that's called. Yeah. Although, is it? Okay. although I think, text, I mean, to me, texturized rubber rainwear sounds a bit kinky, but I don't think that Ian meant it that way. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to kink shame. But it does not sound kinky to me, Omen. We're going to kink acknowledge. <laughs> kink acknowledge and then kink ignore. <laughs> kink move on. <laughs> Come and play Shades of Grey in my black and white strip cartoon. Come and play Shades of Grey in my black and white strip cartoon. So, ah, uh, Nick, the central imagery of this song baffles me. It really does. I'm going to... Oh, who was the woman who cooked on television? Julia Child. Uh, Julia Child's like, I'm going to throw the pasta at the wall and see if it sticks. So, shades of gray. Well, in London, in the middle of the night, especially when it's raining, which it must Mm -hmm. be if you're wearing texturized rubber rainwear, it's quite gray. Shades of gray. Go on. Black and white. Well, it's also black and this, the, you know, there's, there's a lack of color. It's, London becomes very desaturated, especially at certain hours. Okay. So, is he saying, that he prefers that black and white, that strip cartoon-like feel to the blaze of color that's going on inside wherever she's working? Hmm. Or there's a romantic... Romance in the sense of 
not like me giving you flowers romance, but romance in like kind of a, a fantasy realm. So there's a, a romance aspect oh, to yes. meeting in the dark and and taking a walk and you, you walk from from pool of, of street light to street light. Yes, 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 yes. I like where you're going with there's this. There's a romance there and like a honeymoon period feel to that as opposed to being like in a full-fledged year down the road relationship. Yes. If you think of strip cartoons and graphic novels, I'm thinking of them right now. Are you thinking of them, Nick? Um, yes. Okay. Got it. So there is there's this kind of play that is utilized like in cinema between long shot and close up. Sure. Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so we can, you know, maybe imagine that that the experience of meeting this this young lady, I presume she's young, meeting this lady in the rain is a a mixture of kind of formality and intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, right. I shall meet you after your work and we will go for a walk, mm-hmm. which is very formal. And also, you know, oh, I have to lean close to get under your Wellington hat. <laughs> your your beef Wellington. <laughs> Do not use a beef wellington to protect you from the rain. You will get greasy and it will get destroyed. And never ask to see a woman's beef wellington on the first date. No. Ill-advised. You will get greasy and destroyed. Omen. Yes, Nick? Are we just going to... Ignore the politician? I would surely like to. Can we? Well, no, I don't think so. But, (laughs) but, But there's one other thing that I want to say about colors. Mm, okay, okay. So we have the only colors that are mentioned in the song. We have yes. Soho lights, black cat yeah. winks at me darkly, cherries, which are red. A large snowball of cherries is a bag of white strip cartoon. We all know the color of cherries. It's implied enough that I think you can, and they're vivid. can count that as a, a color reference, yeah. Right, black and white. Mm-hmm. Gray. Gray. Mm-hmm. Mm, texturized rubber rainwear. I don't know. No, I don't think. I mean, that's it. That's really that's it, it, right? So, where was I going with this, Nick? I'm so glad you asked. So, I think that one of the things that he could possibly say that he's that we could possibly infer is is this is my tentatively getting into the chorus. Strip cartoon is all I'm after. Strip cartoon is all I crave. Strip cartoon is all I'm after. Strip cartoon. Is everything black and white because he feels black and white about this person? There, there is no gray area for in terms of his feelings about this person. Hmm. But he he says, "Come play shades of gray." Yes. In my black and white strip cartoon. Come and play shades of gray in my black and white strip cartoon. So he wants that. He's asking for that. Maybe he's saying, "I feel." binary about this i feel black and white about this and you feel you are displaying a certain gray coyness in the relationship Mm. and so and maybe that is refreshing to him because he sees the world in black and light black and white okay he's inviting a a new view ambiguity experience yeah yeah uh okay okay now here i'm gonna i'm gonna posit something else okay (sighs) Is he referring to the person as the strip cartoon? The cartoon who strips. Oh, so she is a cartoon. Yes, like like you say, oh, they're they're pretty as a picture. Hmm. It's probably... A bit of a reach, isn't it? Probably a little... Well, I I was going to say... To me, calling something a cartoon is is that it's like it's a caricature. It's it's a yeah. an exaggeration of what it ought to be. Yeah, yeah, certainly. But I I don't know if that I don't know if that definition, if that translation, would work in seventy six. You know, I I don't know if we discussed this for seventy six years, if we would ever really get to the bottom of his intention between behind the phrase strip cartoon. Maybe he just liked how it sounded. And it fit. Maybe Slick Baboon was already used in another song by a competing band. Yeah. Slick Baboon. You haven't heard of Pink Floyd's Slick Baboon? Yeah, you're just another brick in the Slick Baboon. You're just a slick. You're just another slick in this baboon. In the baboon, yeah. Yeah. 
All right, what could possibly be the meaning behind because I'm a leading politician at a dangerous age? Because I'm a leading politician at a dangerous age. Dangerous age meaning too young and given too much power. Mm -hmm. Dangerous age meaning what I think more likely what is more current to us is way too old and out of touch and needs to get the hell out of politics. Interesting. Both interesting. But how do either of them work? Well, I wonder if the answer is maybe in the middle somewhere. Someone who has had a career and is a rising star and is it and is at the point where something could derail them or not. You know, you know what I mean? Like if you get to a certain age in politics and they find out that you are a drug addict, they're like, well, yeah, but look at his record. <laughs> right, yeah. Or if you're young enough... He doesn't have that buffer. Right, or if you're young enough, they're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, sure, he does drugs, but he just started out, you know, give him a chance to reform himself. But if you're in that middle spot yeah. and you're just about to secure your your legacy as a politician... That might be a dangerous age. Your tenure, essentially, yeah. And being a politician in that time frame, hanging around on the street with a dancer, a stripper, or whatever. A cocktail server? Could be dangerous, sure. Oh, maybe it is that. Or is the danger that he might do something crazy and get married? Oh. Oh, man, I, I don't, I don't know and I don't like it. <laughs> you don't know, you don't like, you don't like not knowing or you don't like. I don't knowing. like not knowing. It's, it's, it's frightening. We are, we are truly gazing into the void of the, of lyrics right here. Yeah, I think I, I, one of the, one of the things that, that we did say in that conversation is I, we feel that there is something that we're missing here yeah. culturally somewhere around the time, some sort of a reference, right. even just a, a, a turn of phrase that we're not aware of. Or, or does leading politician refer to someone specifically? Does the strip cartoon? Right. Did something happen around then that we just don't know about? Yeah. There's also the historical relationship between cartoons and politicians you know one of the primary mm. mm-hmm. uses of cartoons is political satire and that goes sure. back i mean you know forever the, yeah i mean to the romans pre-colonial yeah yeah probably pre-romans omen i'm i'm gonna call it here okay. <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna put out a plea mm. we don't do this often we do it every episode no, we don't actively plea. We stumble ignorantly we silently and people plea. feel pity for us. And then they, they The whole podcast in. is a cry for help. <laughs> but this one is an active cry for help. If any and and I know I don't need to because you guys are awesome and you chime in whenever we get anything wrong or miss something, so we appreciate that. So please give us your and even if you don't have a fact, give us your theories on this, please. Yeah. Please. And we will read them. Do you enjoy the cartoons, Nick? I used to read them as as a kid, but I find the funny the funny pages, the funny the funny papers. I f- I find them pretty inane mm. now. Yeah, not so much funny. Ever since the no, once just, the Far Side cartoon stopped, it was all downhill from there. It really was, yeah, yeah. And Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, too. Calvin and Hobbes, yep, yeah, absolutely, yeah, really good. Classic giants, giants among among morons, yeah. <laughs> So come to my place around 12.30 Cause I'm a leading politician And I believe So before we get into our closer, I think we should do a couple of more correspondence since we have a a titch of time here. Yes. We've got so much valuable information from Joe via Instagram. They are stylists. They're very overtly concerned with the uh, image. God, I love that sting. I'm so proud of that sting, dude. (laughs) 
All right, so we, we got a stack here, and literally just another one came in, so I'll add it at the end. Oh, no. Thank you so much, Joe. Joe is our resident, like, actual musician who, who has information. And remember, he's still working his way back up through the catalog from f- far, far back. So we're going to start with Cheap Day Return. You were musing on who played which guitar parts. My money is very much on Ian playing the folkish rhythm with Martin adding the bluesy single note fills. In fact, I'll be bold enough to say I know it. I have no concrete documentation, but each guitar part screams of their individual styles as well as traditional roles. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I'll, I'll take it. I agree. Gosh, what a beautiful song that is. Indeed. Next, Mother Goose. You mentioned trying to play this and finding it difficult, which a lot of those folky picking patterns can be tricky. I I imagine this was you saying that you did try and and fiddle with it at one point and and had an issue with it. Yes. But did you try using a capo? Mm. The vast majority of Ian's guitar parts capo off the third fret, meaning that where you'd have to put bar, B-A-R-R-E, pun intended, Mm -hmm. he says no pun intended, but let's be honest, at the third fret, with a capo, you can simply play open chords. Much easier to manage. I'm pretty sure Mother Goose uses a capo. I double-checked. Mother Goose is capoed at the fifth fret. Very, very exciting. Also, I do want to say that it was likely not due to my lack or having of a capo, but because of (sighs) me being a very bad guitarist. But th- but an excellent point that Ian does use a cable very often. I remember seeing that in concert. Great. Mm-hmm. Good to have in our minds. As I did walk by Hampstead Fair, I came upon the Goose. So I turned her loose as she was screaming. I just finished your My God episode, Mm. and I have a recommendation for you. If you haven't already heard it, namely the live version of My God that can be found on the Carnegie Hall 1970 concert on Tull's 25th anniversary boxed set. It provides additional insight into the song that I didn't know until I heard it. Mm. And Jesse Winter actually pointed me to this, and I, I have heard it before, but it's a good reference to pull back to. First, as evidenced by its date, it is from the Benefit Tour, not Aqualung. Oh, interesting. While introducing it, Anderson told the audience that it was originally intended for Benefit, but they weren't happy with how it turned out. So it would probably be on their next, still unnamed, album. Here's a tune that's, um, you know, we've been trying to get onto a record. And, you know, we failed kind of dismally. We, we, we tried to record this and it really turned out shitty, you know? But that was one of our off days, I hope. <laughs> but it, it will be on the next album and we'll play it for you now. My God. Huh, interesting. And the version they play is noticeably different. Where Barr's guitar doubles the bass line on the studio version, here he plays full chords behind it. One hears why it needed refinement. The studio version is much more powerful, in my opinion. The lyrics are also slightly different. And the bloody Church of England is, and the Jewish Christian Muslim is waiting to be free, each claiming to be part of him while also part of me. The bloody Church of England in chains of Christian Muslim is waiting to be free. Each claim is just a part of him, also a part of me. 
I, I find it interesting that it almost seems like he's moving from a a critique of the religion that he grew up with to a critique of all religions everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot broader and general. Yeah, and putting a finer point on the Catholicism angle. And the graven image you know who is, and the graven image Catholic. No room for interpretation there. Yeah, yeah. And the graven image you know who. And the graven image Catholic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Such passion. Yeah, really. He's on Thick as a Brick now. I've been so stoked to make it to Thick as a Brick. There's so much to unpack. You guys are excellent unpackers. And so far, it's everything I hoped for. Hey, you you should see me try to go on vacation. I'm terrible at getting everything in the suitcase. In this episode, you posited the question as to what how to sing in the rain could mean. Mm. My theory is that it's referencing a carefree quality. In other words, as you're playing Monopoly with other people's lives and your own, don't worry about the consequences of your actions. Keep singing in the rain, singing in the rain. Singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feel, and I'm happy again. That was for you. Do you know that he had a terrible flu when he was recording that? When he when they filmed when they filmed that scene? Would not be surprised at all. That's why he has such a a, a beautiful dreamy quality. On screen mm. because he has a he's, fever of hundred. He's drugged out. <laughs> and then he says, in short, teach him to be ruthless and to enjoy himself while doing it. Yeah. Love it. Good interpretation. So he's on Thick as a Brick Part 4. This is Stab's Instrumental. Like you guys, this is my favorite section off of Thick as a Brick. As you noted, and I completely agree, the way it builds from a pretty, almost lighthearted jaunt to the brutally dark stabs is incredibly powerful. In fact, as you may or may not remember from my Tull Rankathon, which follow J-M-A-N-N-S-E-E-L-O 27, j man c 27, he ranked every single Tull album in order oh my. of his his preferences and, and gave blurbs on them. They were fantastic. But as you may remember from my Toll Rankathon, Stabs straight up terrified me <laughs> when I was a kid. I think it's meant to. The very end with the wind and spooky sounds that I think is an organ played in a very low register, mm. but I could be wrong. More musical musings. I'm quite sure that the instrumental melody on Childhood Heroes is an electric piano. I'm 100% sure that the bouncing electric guitar in Stabs was done with delay, as well as some studio stereo panning in different ears. Oh yes, definitely. Reverb was a very close guess, but where reverb makes the instrument sound blurry and echoey, delay provides a harder repeat, such as we hear in Stabs. I too had the opportunity to meet one of my heroes, none other than Martin Lancelot Barr himself. His band played at Smith's Old Bar here in Atlanta, and after the show, he stayed to talk to his fans. I'm happy to report that he was an incredibly nice guy. His wife was with him, and she was beaming as I stumbled to tell him how much his music influenced my life, and that I became a professional guitarist in large part due to him. I even got him to sign my copy of Benefit that I brought with me and kept in the car, just in case. Sometimes it is good to meet your heroes. That's so sweet. What a lovely story. Yeah. And finally, the one that came in just today, he is on Thick as a Brick Part 5 in reference. One cool thing about the beginning of this is that taken alongside stabs on side A, it's a nice example of, quote, arch form, unquote, Hmm. in composition, arch form. It's a song form that goes A section, B, C, B, and back to A, forming a musical arch. 
Stabs starts with the stabbing guitars, then the harsh organ solo plays over the top, and then breaks down into the wind sounds. Flip the side of the album. Mm. We then open with the wind sounds. Then the flutes come in playing the same melody harmonies that the organ played, and then the slowed down guitar stabs finish the section before the whole band kicks in to start the song proper. A B C fl flip side C B prime prime denoting a slight variation on the original theme. A prime. Well, and taking that architecture, what that implies, Nick, is that the the keystone of that whole arch is flipping the album. Mm. making the listener themselves an integral part of that yeah. architecture. Kind of brilliant. Absolutely. I didn't even think about that. That's great. To our other podcast, Muse Masonry to me, where we will talk about the important rock structures that form the basis of musical compositions. And finally, one last Instagram, not from Joe actually, but from Tan Coda, T A N K O D A. He's the amazing origami artist. Ah, oh. amazing work. He says, Two thoughts. Do you think that Kensington Hayes could be a play off of slash not copyright infringement of London Fog? <laughs> Interesting. Maybe Salamander was wearing a London Fog. I see you walking by my window In your Kensington Hayes Salamander and London Fog is a... A Coke company. Yeah, clothing company. A textile brand from 1923. Wow. So that is very, very funny. I would never have thought of that. And that is inc that is entirely plausible. Absolutely brilliant. And then finally, and the beginning of Salamander always reminds me of Cold Wind to Valhalla. Yeah. But maybe that's just the sharp acoustic. And I didn't put it together, but pulling these clips, it blew my face off. Oh, then get ready for this. Okay. We've got Salamander first. Now, Cold Wind to Valhalla. Hmm. A 
It's like copy and paste. Yeah, more specifically, copy, move the capo, and then paste again. <laughs> copy and copy. I, wh when I, I listened to The Salamander and I pulled the clip, and then I went to Cold Wind of Valhalla and I played it. I was like, did I, yeah. did I pick the wrong, am I listening to Salamander again? I think there's something in the, in the strumming or picking pattern that is, he must be using exactly the same pattern. Yeah. And, and that's not that uncommon. I mean, there, there are lots of... There are lots of patterns of picking and, and strumming that you reuse because it's like a standard thing. Yeah, it's effective and it sounds good regardless of your key, your chords. But but it is it does seem like it's the same chords, just maybe moved up a half. Step. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So great note there. Great notes from from Tancoda, from Joe, absolutely our resident musician. Thank you. We appreciate it. And I mean, let's. What what are we gonna do next week, Omen? Oh, that's right. You don't know. I, well, I hesitate to tell you. Don't tell me, Nick. Don't tell me. Let it be a surprise. It's a surprise for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Come back next week for the final, final bonus track off of Too Old to Rock and Roll, Too Young to Die. A mystery song, a pop quiz, if you will. That's right. Cannot wait for you to hear this one. It's going to be fun. Okay. Until next week, you can meet me on the Star Road. <laughs> where I, I was going to make a, a Mario Kart reference. It didn't quite uh -huh, work. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rainbow Road, black and white. If you the, feel the... like expressing <laughs> yourself in pictorial linguistic fashion, yes. three panels will not be enough. You will need five star panels. That's right. One star per panel. That's all we accept. And that's, that's it. it. <laughs> Until, Until next week, I am Omen Said. I am Nick McGill. Together, we are Feckless Moms. And this is Talk Tall to Me. What ho, Percival! A fine day for hunting, is it not? Lord Featherington, I'm so happy that you could join me on this glorious day for killing animals here, here in the, the New Forest. I'm so happy that you kicked out all of the peasants for this wonderful, wonderful hunting ground. Yes, three cheers for King Henry, hip hip, and so on. Ha ha ha. Um, mm. yeah. <laughs> so what are we hunting today, oh, Percival? Oh, anything that moves. <laughs> oh, 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 <laughs> Lord, Lord, Lord Featherington. Lord Featherington, look over there. Is that? What is it? What is, it's a, is that a fox? It's, it's a, it's a fox. We shall kill the fox. Shoot it, shoot it. <laughs> I killed it, yes. Are we using bows? I, uh, that, that, I killed it with, with my dagger. I threw it. Oh, oh, throwing yeah, knives. Yes. What a sporting gentleman you Indeed. are. Oh, oh, Lord Fellington, what's that over there? <laughs> rustling in the bushes, yes. Is that a hunting girl? Is it a fine maid? Yes, oh, it is. Kill oh, it. <laughs> <laughs> Kill it. Yeah. <laughs> Filthy peasants will leave that one. Indeed, yes, yes. Someday, someday there'll be a Tesco's right over there behind the pond, <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. <gasps> Whoa, what's that there? Lord, is that a tiny new Lord Feathington. <gasps> Does it have a microphone? It is the most glorious prey of all. So ho, so ho, so ho. It is Toctal to me. Oh, those are such a proud member of the Feckless Moms Audio Network. So ho, release the so hounds. Ho. Kill it! <laughs> <laughs>